Hi everybody, Christine Gillespie here again, the Retail and Tourism Manager for Historic Huguenot Street. Uh, one of the many virtual programs that we're offering on our Facebook pages is a weekly reading of an excerpt or a few from one of the books in our museum shop. And this week uh, we will be talking about the American Revolution, A Visual History. Um, this is done by DK Books in partnership with the Smithsonian Institute, and you can see it's pretty hefty. It's a really nice coffee table book, um, and it's full of uh, beautiful images and really neat um, laid out pages, and we'll go through today and I'll show you kind, kind of uh, some of my favorites, um, so you can take a look at those. Um, a little bit about the book before we get started. The American Revolution visual history will transport you back in time and onto the front lines. This complete overview of the war brings all of the action to life, from the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party to the Declaration of Independence and the Treaty of Paris. Beginning with the first stirrings of a colonial resistance, the American Revolution presents illustrated accounts of every major military action and comprehensive timelines for every stage of the war revealing first-person accounts by soldiers and civilians and profiles of the war's main protagonists, from George Washington to Benedict Arnold. Gallery spreads feature collections of weapons and uniforms as feature selections detail the politics of the war, such as the treatment of prisoners and the revolution's implications for women, Native Americans, and African Americans. So, what I've been doing with my weekly readings is choosing sections in the books and reading from them based on what I think you guys will be interested in hearing, um, the parts that I personally find intriguing in the text. With this, because it is more of a coffee table book and it's um, full of more images than the other ones we've looked at, I'm not really going to be doing a whole lot of reading today, um, but I will be going through the book and showing you some of the pages that I thought were standing out and that you would be interested in seeing. So bear with me because this is a heavier book, so it might be a little harder for me to show, but I'm going to do my best. Um, and as always, we can start with the table of contents. And again, this book is broken down by timeline. Um, it does a really good job of organizing things in a manner that I think is really easy for anybody to understand. So you can see what the table of contents looks like here. Um, so when you go through each page, you can see kind of a little bit more about what each section looks like. There's also some images and things on the bottom of the pages. Um, so this gives you a really nice idea of exactly what you'll be looking at in the book. And I wanted to start today um, with a section from the foreword. This is written by Jennifer Jones. She's an editorial consultant for the book and you can see it's accompanied with a portrait of George Washington and the caption on the painting says George Washington at Princeton George Washington sat for this portrait by Charles Wilson Peale to celebrate his victory at Princeton in 1777 painted from life this definitive image is thought to be a true likeness of the American hero so she goes to say in the foreword Americans went to war to win their independence from Great Britain. Just weeks after fighting broke out at Lexington and Concord, the Continental Congress appointed George Washington commander-in-chief of the army for a defense of the American liberty. Outmatched American troops often retreated but returned to fight again, frustrating British efforts to crush, crush their rebellion. A stunning American victory at Yorktown finally slapped British Britain's will to fight, and in 1738, both parties signed the Treaty of Paris, and America had won its independence. 200 years later, during the bicentennial events at Yorktown, Virginia, in October 1981, I witnessed Americans again dressed in the brightly covered, colored uniforms of George Washington's Continental Army, as well as those of militia units and guards of the original 13 colonies. They reenacted the battles that finally won our independence, and specters were able to experience the sounds, the smells, and the feels of the battle. It took thousands of spectators back in time to give us a small glimpse into the era when our forefathers fought to secure our freedoms and form a new nation. 
This book serves as a visual survey of the American Revolution, our war for independence, but indeed a war that included the world. Many countries with colonies and interests in the New World fought in the conflict, along with Native Americans. Finally, through revolution and new nation, the United States was formed. This book draws on collections throughout the world, and most especially from the Smithsonian Institute. The Smithsonian has been collecting and preserving Revolutionary War materials since its founding in 1846. Most of the Washington material came to the institution from the Patent Office collections. Other materials came to us as family heirlooms, passed down from generation to generation, and given to the National Museum to be preserved for the future. The objects, art, and documents of the period are key to telling and illustrating the story of the founding, from engravings by Paul Revere, to paintings and portraits by Peel, to original documents, drawings, maps, and illustrations, and first-person accounts. Illustrated timelines, colorful maps, and gallery spreads filled the vintage military material further help the reader to visualize and understand the war. So that was a really nice foreword by uh, Miss Jennifer Jones. And I wanted to show you how each section starts. Um, each one has an iconic uh, painting or image to introduce the chapter. This one is from Resistance to Rebellion. The next thing that they do, which I think is really cool, and this is also continued through the book, is they give you a map of the area. And you can see kind of as each chapter goes how these maps evolve over time and borders are changing and um, things like that. So that's really cool. And then after a map is a timeline. And these timelines are really neat. Um, give you a sec, guys, to look at it and see if anything's jumping out to you. But I really like how they're broken down here. Um, it's laid out with the grid pattern, which I think is really easy to follow. And it's, you know, a really nice way to look at the timeline and these these facts without getting too bogged down with information and dates and things like that. So each chapter includes a map and a timeline. The pages are laid out um, throughout the book uh, kind of different from each other, but they also have the same theme and look and feels to them, but depending on what's being discussed on the page, the, the layout of the page might be a little different, but you can see here, this is an example of what a page looks like. So there's usually text about um, whatever topic they're covering at the time. There's some images, paintings, um, captions to clue you in on all the extras on the page. There's usually a little blurb. Um, here in the corner or on the other side with some extra facts involved. Um, so like I said, this book is really neat um, because of the way it's laid out and I think it's really easy to read through and skim um, and I think would make a really cool gift for anybody who's into history or the American Revolution in general. Um, uh, so yeah, here is a painting called The First Prayer in Congress and on to show this page to you guys. You can see everybody's meeting the First Continental Congress, one of these iconic paintings that we know very well um, through school and learning about uh, American history growing up. And then I wanted to show, read from here, this little blurb about the First Continental Congress. So it says, Eyewitness Account, September 1774. The government is dissolved. Fleets and armies and the present state of things show that government is dissolved. The distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. I go upon the supposition that government is at an end. All America is thrown into one mass. And that was written by Patrick Henry, a delegate of Virginia, as recorded in the diary of John Adams from September 6, 1774. Another little blurb here, first-hand account. 
says, Desirous as I am to promote the freedom of the colonies, I beseech you by the respect you are bound to pay to the instructions of your constituents, by the regard you have for the honor of your country, and as you wish to avoid a war with Great Britain, which must terminate at all events in the ruin of America, not to rely on a denial of Parliament, because whatever pro protestations may have made to the contrary, it will prove to the world that we intend to throw off our allegiance to the state and to involve the two countries in all of the horrors of a civil war. And that was from Joseph Galloway, delegate of Pennsylvania, from the Journals of the Continental Congress, September 28, 1774. So when you flip through the book, um, like I said, it's laid out in a timeline, um, but also each kind of um, important topic or battle or person has their own um, delegated section. Um, another one I chose for you guys to look at is the Militia and Continental Army. This is a page featured in the start of the war, um, which is the first chapter here. And if you want to just take a peek at this, you can see. Um, anybody who has been to our site and um, maybe has taken a tour in the Abraham Hasbrook house might recognize this notice. Um, I chose this because I thought it was really neat. We have a notice like this up in the home in the um, what we call the boys' bedroom. Um, Daniel Hasbrook and his wife Feincha, they had many children, um, but five of their sons uh, fought in the American Revolution, and they all signed um, their names to fight for the Continental Army. So I thought that was really cool to see the notice in here and also make the connection to our site. Um, and kind of bring it back home to Huguenot Street because even though we didn't have any fighting on Huguenot Street, we had many people involved in the war. So the next um, pages that I wanted to show you guys um, feature the Declaration of Independence, which we all know very well. You can see here, it's got a big two-sided uh, pages for you guys. And I wanted to read you some of these little fun facts on the sides of the pages that I mentioned earlier. Um, one of them says, uh, signed and sealed, a suitably engrossed or official copy of the declaration was made on parchment, but it was not ready to sign for another month. Most of the 56 delegates who appended their signature did so on August 2nd, 1776, and the remainder signing over the following weeks which I had no idea about that. So that's really cool. You can read through these and find out some things that you may have not have known before. Um, there's also in here some features on some specific people, like you can see um, on this page, we are looking at John Dickinson. He became the penman of the revolution and famed for his hand in drafting key documents. Um, and over here you can see this painting. The painting is Down with the King, it's called Independence in New York City pulled down the statue of King George III on July 9, 1776 in a symbolic toppling of the crown's authority. Francis Xavier Hederman's illustration was one of many artworks to record the event. Um, so that's a, you know, another really important uh, step to be taken in the colonies, um, those New Yorkers tearing down that statue. One of the other things in here that they're telling us is that uh, 70 was the age of the oldest signer, um, and that was Benjamin Franklin. And then 26 was the age of the youngest singer, whose name was Edward Rutledge. So that's neat. So like I said, I'm not going to be reading a lot um, of these uh, excerpts today. I think it's a really neat book visually, um, so I don't want to bog down with that. Um, but I do recommend grabbing this title and, and looking through, obviously, on your own. Um, 
Throughout the book, there are also person highlight pages. So here we have George Washington's, um, which I thought was a really cool one to look at. And it goes on to talk about George and how impressive he was, uh, how he took command and led the Continental Army throughout the Revolution. Um, it also talks about the Purple Heart, um, and I did not know this. Um, but the Purple Heart was introduced by Washington um, as the badge of military merit in 1782. And then the U.S. government revived the decoration bearing Washington's profile on the 200th anniversary of his birth in 1932, which is really neat. Um, so on these pages, we also, we also have George's um, timeline, his personal timeline. Um, from birth till death, any notable events are included on on here. Um, you know, any symbolic life happenings. Um, so he was born in 1732, died in 1799 at his home in Mount Vernon. Um, so there's a closer look at that timeline. I think um, one of the neatest features of this book is all of the images and paintings and um, things that you may not have seen if you haven't been to a specific museum or visited the Smithsonian. Um, so it's nice that we get to see these um, in this book. And the painting that I want to show you now is called Family Pride and it's um, featured on an eyewitness page running the Hudson River Barricade. So we do know that the fighting went up the Hudson River. And here is a painting right here. And the painting um, description says, The family of Admiral Hyde Parker, who captained the HMS Phoenix in the Hudson River attack, commissioned the artist Dominic Saris to commemorate the daring feat. The painting inspired many copies, including this one by William Joy in 1835. So this is not the original painting of the um, battle, but it's a copy of the painting, which is still beautiful to look at. And I thought that it was neat to show because we are home in the Hudson Valley, and the Hudson River means a lot to a lot of people that live here, and it's one of those iconic um, things that we think about um, coming home. Here is another very iconic um, painting that I'm sure many of you will recognize right away. It's the iconic crossing of the Delaware. Uh, and the caption says, on December 25th, 1776, Washington led his troops across the icy Delaware River to deliver a surprise attack at Trenton. Emmanuel Lutz's iconic painting captions captures Washington's sense of mission. And you can see how um, stern and ready to go Washington looks in here and how hard these men are working to get across the icy river. Um, and we know obviously that this is a, um, a very beautiful image. And I'm sure that at the time while they were crossing, um, it would not have been so angelic looking. And um, I didn't realize how actually big this painting was. Um, I saw a photograph of it in the museum where it lives, and it takes up almost a whole wall, which I always imagined it to be smaller and hang on a wall, um, more standard size. So, just a fun fact there. So, getting into one of the later chapters, The Struggle for Mastery, 1777, there's a page dedicated to African American patriots which this book does a really good job um, focusing on uh, forgotten groups or left out groups of people like women, Native Americans, and African Americans. Um, so I'm glad that this page here, plus many other pages in the book, is featured. Um, let's see. So some of these fun facts that we have here. Um, says, little change. Around 500,000 African American slaves lived in America throughout the War of Independence. In most cases, their status remained unchanged after the war. The 5,000 or so African Americans who joined the Continental Army were more fortunate. 
Although most were enslaved when the war began, many were declared free at its end. Nevertheless, in 1783, the Virginia Assembly condemned owners for continuing to keep slaves who had served as soldiers in bondage. Uh, another fact here, progress in the North. Some northern states provided the gradual emancipation of slaves. Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Connecticut passed laws stipulating that children born into slave families must be freed at a young age. And Massachusetts abolished slavery altogether. Um, so this uh, statue over here, I wanted to show you, is a monument. Let's see the glare. There we go. Um, it says, it's called Saluting the Soldiers. 500 um, African-American soldiers served under George Washington at Valley Forge. A monument to them is located where an all-African-American Rhode Island regiment was encamped. So that's a nice monument. One of the other groups that I just mentioned that's usually um, left out or... Um, not really written a whole lot about would be women in the revolution and there is a page here dedicated to that in the widening war chapter of 1778 so here's the page let's see I'll go close up of this painting we have some other images here So let's see what some of our things say. Uh, in our little side box over here, it says, Born to Raise Sons. After the war, reformers in the United States campaigned for, to expand education for women. Only a woman who could read and reason, it was argued, would be able to raise virtuous sons to depend the republic. This ideal of the republican motherhood was, however, counterbalanced by a backlash that reserved full citizenship and the right of suffrage for white men. Progress at last. In the 1830s, women contributed to a raft of social reform movements, including anti-alcohol temperance societies, and in the northern states, activism against slavery. Women were not entitled to vote in elections, and despite some state referendums, did not achieve suffrage until after the 19th Amendment was passed in 1919. And I'll show you guys one more time some of these close-ups over here this image here is um, what's called the symbol of a nation a late 18th century banner depicts lady liberty wielding a liberty pole adorned with a liberty cap like the eagle and the snake also featured lady liberty was taken up as a key symbol of the new republic so that's um, from a banner that existed and then this painting Uh, it says, Mission of Mercy. During the Battle of Bemis Heights, British camp follower Lady Harriet Ackland courageously crossed the Hudson River into rebel territory in search for her wounded husband, Colonel John Dyke Ackland. One of the features over here is uh, Deborah Sampson. Disguising herself as a man, Deborah Sampson enlisted in a Massachusetts regiment in 1782 under the name of Robert Shirtlift. Samson fought the British in several skirmishes, taking a sword to cut her head in two musket balls to her thigh near Terrytown. To avoid detection, she cut out one of the balls herself. Deborah served for 17 months before a doctor discovered her true sex. He informed General Peterson and Samson received an honorable discharge. After the war, Samson gave a lecture tour detailing her experiences. Did not know about her. And the last thing I wanted to show you guys is um, under an eyewitness page. You can see here. It is a drawing. Or a sketch. And this is a drawing um, uh, of John Andre that he did of himself. Um, Major John Andre was executed during the war um, for helping Benedict Arnold. 
and he did this um, self-portrait the evening before he was executed, learning of his fate two days, days pre previously. Um, and, you know, he was probably uh, in his head a bit, knowing that in a few days he was going to be executed, um, and drew this self-portrait of himself, which is pretty cool. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you guys before I kind of finish everything up here is in the back of the book there is a directory um, and you can look through this directory by state and see sites relating to the War of Independence that have been preserved that you can visit like battlefields or encampments or homes of some of the important leaders. So it's categorized by state which is nice. So if you ever are traveling or you perhaps want to see what's in your state that you might not have been aware of, um, this is a good guide for all of those places that are um, important for this war. Um, there's also an index in the back of the book that makes it really easy to flip through and find any topic that you're looking at um, without having to scroll through the chapters. So again, here's our beautiful cover, The American Revolution of Visual History. And we have our back here. So like I said, this book would make a great gift for a history buff or um, somebody that just loves visual learning. Um, you don't have to be a history buff to enjoy this book. I think there's something in it for everybody. Um, but it would make a really great gift, especially if you have a focus in the American Revolution or one of the, our founding fathers and the history of them. And I do want to say that with this book this week, um, we kind of wanted to tie in the theme um, with Memorial Day having been celebrated earlier um, in the week and um, say thank you to those that made the ultimate sacrifice during uh, war for, for the United States and supporting our country. Um, and I wanted to say again, thank you guys so much for tuning in with me. If you want a copy of the American Revolution of Visual History, it is available on our online shop all year round. But starting today through um, next Wednesday, June 3rd, you can get 10% off the book's original price of $40 at your checkout. And we can have it shipped out to you. If you live locally, we can arrange a safe curbside pickup. Um, again, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope everybody's staying happy and healthy and um, looking forward to seeing you guys next week.